Thank you very much for being here for this terrific discussion about the history of drug policy. Uh, as a historian, I'll say it is more of a recent history, uh, but we've got a little bit of reflection on historical precedents earlier today. Uh, my name is Khalil Gibran Mohammed. I'm the director of the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture. Uh, we are excited to host the second day of this conference. Uh, so uh, the Schomburg staff looks forward to supporting this effort tomorrow. We look forward to seeing you there. Um, I am also a former history professor at Indiana University and the author of The Condemnation of Blackness, Race, Crime, and the Making of Modern Urban America. My job is to introduce you to our panelists, get out of the way. Uh, they will deliver their uh, papers uh, between 12 and 15 minutes. Um, I will make a few brief remarks and we'll open the floor for conversation. You've done this. Uh, so let's get started. Our first speaker today is Sasha Abramsky. He is a freelance journalist and book author. His first three books, Hard Times, Conned, and American Furies, explored the rise of mass incarceration in modern day America and its political and cultural impact. His next two books were Breadline USA, The Hidden Scandal of American Hunger and How to Fix It, and Inside Obama's Brain. His most recent book is The American Way of Poverty, How the Other Half Still Lives. In addition to his writing, Bromsky teaches part-time in the university writing program at the University of California at Davis. He is originally from London, England. He is second to my left. Please join me in welcoming Sasha Bromsky. <laughs> Following Sasha will be Samuel Roberts, uh, who probably needs a little introduction here. He is one of the uh, major forces behind this conference and the collaborative work that happens here at Columbia University around drug policy, criminal justice issues, etc. He is an associate professor of history and associate professor of sociomedical sciences at Columbia University's Melman School of Public Health. Uh, he is the author of Infectious Fear, Politics, Disease, and the Health Effects of Segregation, published by UNC Press in 2009. He is currently researching and writing a book-length project on the policy and politics of race, drug addiction, and the United States war on drugs between the 50s and the 90s, a period which covers heroin and crack, and as well the origins of the methadone maintenance treatment in MT in the 60s and 70s. Doctor, he's got one more spot here, harm reduction in 1980s and 90s. I'm going to give him a full plate. Dr. Roberts is a member of the Melbourne School, and as well is the director of the Institute for Research in African American Studies at Columbia. Uh, his talk is entitled New York State's Narcotic Addiction Control Commission, Compulsory Treatment and the Road to Rockefeller Drug Law, 67 to 74. He is to my far left. <laughs> Next on the docket is Julili Kohler Hausman. She is an assistant professor of history at Cornell University. Her current book project, Tough Politics, examines the embrace of punitive, social, and criminal policy during the 1970s, which helped to fundamentally restructure conceptions of citizenship and state legitimacy in the United States. Her articles have been pub published in the Journal of Social History and the edited collection, Challenging the Prison Industrial Complex. Prior to graduate school, Kohler Hausman spent six years organizing around labor, welfare, and anti-poverty issues in Washington State. This is Jalili. <laughs> and finally, Gabriel, how do you pronounce your last name, Gabriel? Saya. Saya? Saya. Saya. Gabriel Saya is the Director of Drug Policy Alliance's New York Policy Office. He joined DPA in 2003 as a member of the development team, joined the policy team in 2004, and 2005 launched DPA's Innovative State Organizing and Policy Project. I guess in the process of raising money, you figured out what was going on. All right. I wasn't any good. Or at least how to communicate it. He directed the project until 2010, coordinating DPA's work in numerous states, including Alabama, Connecticut, and New York. Today, Saye, Saya, and his team works in New York City and across the state 
partnering with community organized, organizing groups, human service agencies, and researchers to advance drug policies that are guided by science, compassion, health, racial justice, and human rights. Recent successes include reform of New York's draconian Rockefeller drug laws and the passage of historic legislation to prevent accidental overdose fatalities. Uh, please join me in welcoming Gabriel. Sasha, the floor is yours. Good evening, and thank you for inviting me to this fascinating conference. What I'm going to do today is talk about the overlap of coercive anti-drug strategies and of poverty in the United States. And they're both themes that I've written on extensively over the last 20 years of my journalism. And both, they're both of them, it seems to me, speak to a larger issue. The issue is that a country that has carefully crafted a self-image around the ideas of upward mo mobility, economic opportunity, and bounty tends to react extremely coercively to those whose daily lives do not fit into that image of the American dream. We've created over the last 40 years what might be called a carceral safety net. It's a system of housing and of feeding the poorest of the poor and the most addicted of the poor that features prison and jail as its central institution. It costs far more than non-incarcerative welfare systems in other countries and it's far less effective at ameliorating the conditions of poverty that generate crime, that generate drug dealing, and so on. Two million Americans, give or take, are incarcerated at any moment in time in the early 21st century. Another five million Americans are on probation or parole. Put them together, and more than one in 30 American adults now have their lives intimately controlled by criminal justice bureaucracies. In 2012, CNN labeled this a $1 trillion failure talking specifically about the war on drugs, which constitutes a large part of America's carceral problem. I'm not going to burden you with too many numbers in this presentation, but I will give you a few. In 1980, the Bureau of Prisons, the federal prison system, had 4,900 inmates serving time for drug charges. In the year 2011, that number was 94,600. 48% of all federal prisoners in modern America are in prison on drug charges. Now it strikes me that it's no coincidence that the modern war on drugs, and then more generally the war on crime that flows out of that in the 1980s and the 1990s, in which created an extraordinary mosaic of mandatory minimum sentences, it's no coincidence that this comes about as public patience with Lyndon Johnson's war on poverty from the 60s and the 70s starts to wane. Now, President Johnson had ambitiously essentially pledged not just to limit poverty, but to eliminate it from the American landscape. His policies were a partial success. They did severely limit poverty in America. They took millions of Americans out of hunger. They gave millions of elder Americans access to health care. They did put in place drug treatment programs, mental health clinics, and so on in the community. But what they didn't do was literally consign American poverty to the history books. Now, it's that failure to achieve what was essentially a utopian goal that it seems to me opens the floodgate to a much more coercive backlash, an anti-poor backlash. Starts in the late 70s and acquires increasing momentum from the Reagan years onwards. And I think the psychological rationale is something like this. If poverty can't be eradicated, then at least its unpleasant, its messy consequences can be swept under the rug. They can be consigned to the darkest corners of our society, to out-of-the-way prisons in out-of-the-way communities where millions of people will be allowed to essentially rot. It's the failure of the war on poverty's empathic ideals to last into the 80s and the 90s that opens the door to the prison boom, that consigns millions of Americans, men, women, even minors, to spending years of their lives behind bars. And it's the failure to convince the majority of voting Americans to accept the poor in general as us rather than as them that facilitates a muscular, deeply coercive modern day response, not just to drugs, but to poverty in general. It's out of that lack of empathy that a man with as large a podium as Rush Limbaugh can use that podium to go after kids on summer feeding programs, hungry kids who during the school year are given free and reduced breakfasts and lunches. 
during the summer holidays go hungry. So there's a feeding program being put in place around the country to alleviate their hunger. And Rushdie Limbaugh uses his platform to go after hungry kids. And he says that a summer feeding program is creating a generation, and this is a quote, of wanton little waifs and serfs. Well, it seems to me that it's that same lack of empathy for the hardships and the challenges faced by the poor that also fuels the war on drugs. As long as we think it is others, morally blameworthy others, who are taking drugs, who are using drugs, whose communities are impacted by drugs, so it becomes easier to fund and to perpetuate an increasingly senseless war on drugs. And the numbers are staggering. Come back to a few more numbers. In 2009, 86,000 people were sent to federal prison. Fully 25,000 of them were sent there for drug charges. 91% of all drug convictions in federal court now result in a prison sentence. In 1980, less than 10% of state prisoners were serving time for drug charges. Today it's 25%, and that's of a much larger pool of prisoners. So at every level, the way that we deal with drugs as a society has become more coercive. And the impacts are both horrendous and scandalous. Five million Americans can't vote because they have felony convictions. They can't vote because they're either still in prison or on probation or parole or because they live in a state like Florida or Virginia or Mississippi, there's a common thread there, they're almost all in the Deep South, that still have permanent disenfranchisement laws on the books. Mass disenfranchisement perpetuates public health epidemics, hepatitis C in particular, tuberculosis. And it also feeds into America's poverty epidemic because most of those are men and women who go to prison, leave family behind. And a goodly portion of those men and women who go to prison had some income before prison. And when they go to prison, their families are placed into almost immediate destitution. 2.7 million kids in America have at least one parent behind bars. One in 28 school-aged children. In the African-American and the Latino communities, far, far higher. And yet at the same time, the prison boom is used to camouflage the extent of poverty. The reason for that is when you go to prison, you're no longer counted as being among the unemployed. So if you were unemployed in the free world, you go to prison, suddenly you vanish from the statistics. Now, this has been going on for 40 years, but it does seem to me that at least when it comes to incarceration, we're at something of a turning point. Not because we've suddenly had an empathic awakening in this country, I doubt that's happened overnight. We're at something of a turning point because even the most conservative states have realized they can no longer afford to incarcerate their way out of drug addiction in particular. So the last few years, there's been some really quite interesting stuff going on. Very conservative states like South Carolina have begun reforming their drug laws. Kentucky, which is a relatively small state, aimed to save $400 million by diverting nonviolent drug offenders into treatment programs. Why they didn't do that in the good times is another matter, because if it's effective in the bad times, presumably those drug treatment programs could and should have worked in the good times as well. Bigger states like New York belatedly started rolling back at the Rockefeller laws. Prison population in New York's been going down for several years. The state that I now live in, California, is under court order to reduce its prison population by many thousands of inmates. Again, not because of an empathic awakening, but because so many people are in prison prison system can't deliver constitutionally mandated levels of health care. So even though the incarceration numbers seem to me to have plateaued in recent years, the second part of what I'm talking about, the continued presence and in many cases exacerbation of poverty, is every bit as serious today as it was five years ago, ten years ago, fifteen years ago. One in six Americans lives in poverty. Fifty million Americans lives in poverty. And again, it seems to me that this is tied in and allowed to fester, largely because of the inability of our political processes to talk about these issues empathically. If you don't talk about drug addiction empathically, it's all too easy to lock a drug, drug dealer like Weldon Angelus, a man I met in federal prison in California. He's in prison for 55 years for marijuana dealing. Even the judge who sentenced him said this is an outrageous sentence, but by law and required to impose it. That lack of empathy that lets Weldon Angelus sit in prison for 55 years is the same lack of empathy 
that lets 50 million Americans in the richest country in the world live in poverty today. Now, I'm talking a lot about poverty. As Khalil just mentioned, my new book is called The American Way of Poverty, and it's based around hundreds of interviews that I did in dozens of states over many, many years about the daily lives of America's poor. It's partly an oral history project, and accompaniment to the book is an audio archive called The Voices of Poverty. And the idea was to try and bring to the surface voices and stories that for many years have just been left out of the American narrative, left out of the dominant story of what America is. As I researched the project, I was continually struck both by the complexity of poverty, but also because I have studied the criminal justice system for decades as a journalist, I was struck by how interwoven the story of poverty is with the story of crime and punishment in America. And how, as I've just said, both of them tell a broader story of the demise of empathy in our political narratives. And we see this most directly in societal responses to the most vulnerable, most at-risk populations. If you're an ex-foster care kid, for example, by every measure, you're far more likely to end up extremely poor, living on the streets at some point, and experiencing regular interventions by the criminal justice system, regular interactions with the police, with the courts, with jail or prison. If you're an ex-prisoner, you're far more likely to end up in a shelter and to end up unemployed than a free world peer. If you're mentally ill, you're disproportionately likely to be arrested and to end up in jail or prison, and you're then particularly likely to return to a society that increasingly lacks the basic public health community infrastructure to treat you, to counsel you, to ensure that you're medication compliant, and to help you find suitable employment and regulated housing. If you're an African-American male in this country today, a young African-American male, you are more likely to end up in prison in many states than to complete a four-year college degree. You're more likely to end up jobless and impoverished than a white peers with equivalent levels of education. If you're an undocumented migrant living in an inner city or living in a rural colonia, your life consists of a continuous game of hide and seek with the ever-present possibility that you will be arrested, placed in an ICE holding facility, and eventually deported. And that deportation process will throw you and your family, including your children, into poverty. Now, all of these overlap peculiarly with the drug wars. Despite a slew of studies that show that whites, blacks, browns, all use drugs at roughly the same rate, at every part of the process, African Americans, and to a slightly lesser extent Latinos, are more at risk. They are more at risk of being stopped and frisked by the police. They're more at risk of being arrested. They're more at risk of being charged and of being charged with more serious crimes. They're more at risk of then being prosecuted. And finally, but not least, they're more at risk of ending up behind bars and of ending up behind bars for longer periods of time than a whites charged and convicted of similar crimes. Now, that so many tens of thousands of men and women have served and are serving extreme prison sentences for often minor drug offences seems to me one of the great scandals of the modern era. And that such a large proportion of those inmates are Latino and African American. And that the country's African American population now suffers the world's highest incarceration rate makes that scandal even worse. And given that we have a Supreme Court that has done in recent rulings the country the huge disservice of saying that we are now at a period where our political and judicial process does not need to think about race. We see this in the recent gutting of the Voting Rights Act. Given that that's the, how the Supreme Court sees our country, it strikes me that the data around African-American and Latino disenfranchisement, incarceration, and all the other things that we've talked about are particularly galling and particularly disturbing. It seems to me that we've created a set of conditions in this country over the last 40 or 50 years with this interplay between the war on drugs, the broader war on crime, and the hostility to meaningful, sensible anti-poverty initiatives that all but guarantee that racial minorities will bear a disproportionate impact of the country's incarceration impulses. And it seems to me at the same time that while poverty clearly does impact people of all races and all demographics, 
The way our society is structured at the moment continues to make it more likely that African Americans and Latinos will end up both in poverty and in deeper, harder to get out of poverty than others in the population. It seems to me, and this is where I'm going to wrap it up, that this is a failure of our moral imagination as a society as much as anything else. It's a failure of our ability to empathize, and it's a corresponding willingness to craft social and economic policy on the assumption that those who don't make it have no one to blame but themselves, and that therefore society is both within its rights and its obligation to make the response as punitive and as nasty as possible. Now, when the history books are written, 100 years from now maybe, it seems to me that historians are going to have a huge job trying to understand the incarceration mechanisms of America in the last third of the 20th century, because they ceased to be rational. They began speaking to some of our least rational impulses as a society. And I think that the war on drugs playing such a central role in that will acquire central importance in any understanding of modern American history. When the history books are written in, let's say, the year 2200, to understand modern America, historians will have to grapple with the war on drugs. Now, it seems to me when the history of the early 21st century, our years, are written, it is the expansion of poverty in American society, intimately related with, but slightly separate from, the wars on crime and the war on drugs. It is the rise of income inequalities on a level not seen since the 1920s that will again be the central historical thread through which early 21st century America comes to be understood. These, I believe, poverty and the war on drugs, are the two central domestic moral challenges of our era. They've done incalculated damage, the war on drugs, to our social infrastructure, and the failure to tackle poverty, which is related to drugs and related to crime, the failure to tackle poverty reflects an extraordinary collapse in our political narrative. Thank you very much for having me. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. <laughs> thank you, thank you. All right, I want to say thank you to everyone again for what's been a wonderful day, and I want to remind everyone that tomorrow we will be convening, not here, but at the Schomburg Center for uh, Research in Black History and Culture. As you know, Dr. Khalil Muhammad is the director of the Schomburg and has uh, graciously invited us there. As you probably also know, we've had some, um, some natural light difficulties today. For most of the day, the light has come through. No one has been able to see the slides. And when Khalil came in, he, he told me, he said, you know, when you come to my place, you won't have to deal with that. So um, thank you so much for that welcome and that uh, good-natured ribbing. I, uh, as we've taken for, uh, we've talked a lot about the war on drugs, and uh, this, this, this panel is directed towards some of its history. And uh, many of you know about New York State's Rockefeller drug laws, and my paper and, and Jalili uh, kohler Houseman's paper following will talk about that uh, at some depth. What's, what many of us don't know about the Rockefeller drug law is uh, its prehistory in New York State's program of compulsory, com uh, compulsory treatment, which was administered as the Narcotics Addiction Control Commission uh, between 1966 and 1974. Uh, the, the system of compulsory uh, treatment, also known as civil commitment, fell into rapid disrepute uh, and public, the public politicians, physicians, and inmate patients themselves deem the program a massive disappointment. The next system's failure may be attributed to several factors. Virtually no one was cured, first of all, of his or her quote-unquote addiction, and as a consequence of having been incarcerated, or as a consequence of having been incarcerated in that facility. And there were some 14 of these facilities. By the time the whole system was shut down in 1974, about 24,000 people had been incarcerated anywhere between several months to up to five years. It was a very kind of um, odd system. Um, the best medical understanding, and a lot of this disappointment as well came from the fact that many people believe that this would be a simple cure. And in fact, as we know today, compulsory treatment really does not work um, in treating addiction. We have very, uh, our, our understanding today of addiction medicine is, is quite limited, 
um, the best that we may have, or at least the regular interpretation, is that it, it's a chronic and often relapsing disease. And this is often the, what's called part of the, the NIDA paradigm as well. Um, uh, in fact, it, it, it's in, indeed for this reason that many people, myself included, find fault with the equation of rehabilitation or recovery necessarily with complete drug abstinence. One reason why the NAC system was deemed a failure uh, was that uh, people, when they eventually were released, quite often went back to using drugs, and so hence that's a failure. There really wasn't any study of, well, did they use drugs maybe more uh, in a more controlled manner than normally than they had, or had they gone back and then you know, maybe uh, decided not to do so again. There really weren't that very, very many follow-ups. In essence, the equation was, if you fall off the wagon, then it's a complete failure. And, if you, and, and today we know that's not the case at all, that many people, that that's part of the cycle of recovery. Um, the NAC program was incredibly expensive. It used about a billion dollars, and that's 1967 to 74 dollars. Not today when a billion dollars kind of just goes and comes, right? Um, it was also poorly administered and executed. Many facilities were staffed by individuals who were either poorly trained, not motivated to do the job, or both. And in fact, many of them were converted jails or prisons, and uh, more than one or two actually hadn't even been converted. They just kind of kept the same personnel and, and took the inmates out and put the and put the patients in. Um, and finally, facing all these challenges and contemplating a U.S. presidential bid in which his record on drug addiction will become a campaign issue, Governor Nelson Rockefeller's administration not only lost its political will to continue the program, but it also all but abandoned much of its commitment to treatment as a solution to the problem of, of addiction itself. So uh, if compulsory treatment was shown to be uh, not a success, there was also a lack of political will to try something else. Uh, and it was there that we started to move towards uh, mandatory minimum sentences and uh, draconian punishments for, for possession and use of uh, drugs. Um, the main exception to this might have been Nelson Rockefeller's enthusiasm for methadone maintenance, by the way. Uh, rather than operate its own system of treatment programs, the NAC uh, program moved to fund a wide variety of privately organized facilities, especially methadone maintenance. And having otherwise re retreated from its goal of rehabilitation, the Rockefeller administration set its attention on incarceration, the Rockefeller drug law, um, and, uh, and, and moved away from actually administering its own programs. All right, uh, to say that this was part of what inaugurated the war on drugs is not to say, of course, that drug use or various types of substance use have not been criminalized over the ages. That's patently not true. Even from the late 19th century, the early 20th century, opium, cocaine, were all prescribed uh, in various states and nationally in 1914. And this quite often, in fact, usually had racial connotations. But to argue that this is something novel is to say that in the 1950s and 1960s, we had actually gotten to a point where many physicians were questioning uh, 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 law enforcement or criminal justice approaches to drug addiction. You saw, you saw the AMA, uh, and before that, the, Net, the New York Academy of Medicine, all calling for perhaps a medicalized view of addiction. Um, and in fact, what I want to argue here in the second half of my talk is that civil commitment was actually this, it was at the cusp of where we went from having a medicalized point of view to having a fully criminalized point of view, or almost fully criminalized point of view. That's to say that the idea of compulsory treatment uh, had in it a kind of tough love idea. By the way, a complete failure. I think I might have mentioned that at least once. Um, but it certainly had a certain faith in medicalization, even if it was coerced. Uh, and after that, uh, after its failure, which was largely a political failure, as well as a therapeutic failure, they, uh, the Rockefeller administration, looking again at a presidential bid, basically said, well, you know what, let's just forget the whole thing, and in 1973, moved towards mandatory minimum sentencing, which was entirely a criminalized or criminalization point of view. And this, this kind of jobs with the period that Jonathan Simon marks as the, as the emergence of uh, governing through crime after 1968 when our faith in liberal ideas of, as, as, uh, as Sasha mentioned, of kind of these utopian uh, experiments and kind of statecraft that would also do social good, well, a lot of that went out the window with the conservative backlash. Civil commitment laws, uh, civil commitment laws were not entirely new before the 1960s, but they were revised and reinterpreted to include uh, drug users as their, as their objects. The main two states in this regard, but certainly not the only, were California and, and New York uh, State. 
In California, uh, Governor Brown bragged about the system that he had in place there, which he, to use his language, quarantined drug addicts, many thousands of them, uh, basically leaning or relying upon the language of drug use being a, a, a contagious disease in the best public health effort. I mean, actually, I should take that back because I wouldn't call it a public health effort per se, but he likened it to as such by saying it was a quarantine. And not to be outdone, um, uh, Governor Rockefeller moved in the same direction with the Narcotics Addiction Control Commission, which was created after an amendment to the 1962 Metcalf Volcker Act. And here's a photograph of Rockefeller signing. And um, Rockefeller, always a shrewd politician, had as its first director of NAC, uh, Lawrence Pierce, who was an African American um, uh, district attorney working in Brooklyn. And that kind of insulated Rockefeller from any sort of kind of you know, critique of, of NAC having any sort of racial motivations because, after all, this was a drug program and the politics of race were inescapable. Um, sorry. And uh, actually, the act creating NAC uh, civil commitment program passed in April of 66. Appropriations went up dramatically, as you see here, ballooning up to 76. Uh, 0.5 million in 1969 to 1970, and as a 76.5 million, as I said, by the time it was closed, it went up to a total of a billion dollars. NAC philosophy, uh, particularly that of compulsory treatment of addicts, combined medicine and penology, all right, which are two things that I would not recommend we try to put together, at least as seldom as possible, I would say. I mean, don't quote me, but that's what I would advise. Uh, it institutionalized a long historical tensions which uh, predictably emerged at the outset. Many physicians didn't support civil commitment at all, and for good reason. Um, it, however, the imperative to incarcerate seemed to dominate among those states which adopted a policy. As I mentioned, California used the language of, of uh, not only quarantine, but control and even a mobilization. Of the dual and competing imperative served by NAC, incarceration versus rehabilitation, these dual uh, paradigms, the former was rather straightforward, while the latter suffered a poverty of theoretical which is to say that by 1967, we kind of knew how to punish people, right? It's kind of a straightforward thing. You round them up, you lock them up, and uh, you, know, you decide when and if you will let them out. The idea of actual drug addiction treatment was a, this was like a very new thing on the horizon. It was a frontier in medicine. In fact, many uh, medical schools um, would sooner give away their library than actually offer a program in addiction medicine because that's the kind of professional stigma which attended. Um, so it was a very new uh, thing, and so uh, penology ended up winning out. And in fact, this was, uh, like I said, some of the results were predictable. In fact, many of the patients uh, uh, complained of treatment in there. Uh, actually, let me turn off with my slides. Okay, I'm sorry, I got ahead of my slides. I do apologize. Okay, all right. Um, all right, so uh, like I said, many of the institutions were really no more than refurbished jails or prisons. Uh, many patients complained of, of abuse, physical and emotional. Um, and particularly uh, in the women's facilities, it seemed like uh, some of the, the, uh, the caretakers, or they were actually, they were called narcotics officers, but in fact many of them were just kind of COs who had just gotten another, another civil service certification were more, they seem to be more interested in enforcing gender norms and sexual norms than in actual uh, treatment. One facility, Woodburn um, facility, was literally a prison uh, in which for a time the last prisoners there shared the building with the first of the incoming NAC patients, leaving no time to modify or substantially, uh, to modify substantial building's carceral architecture. Um, uh, an, outside, an outside review of the program basically said that the whole thing was uh, compulsory treatment in New York's, uh, New York's system of compulsory treatment was nothing more than candy-coated jails, as you see here. And that's Dan Waldorf, who uh, later became a famous uh, drug ethnographer and, uh, and, uh, and he actually took a little bit of political backlash for having uh, gone against the New York state system. Uh, also, the rumors got out. Many patients complained to their families, and many families complained to their neighbors. And the whole thing was starting to look really bad, even as early as 1968. It opened in 67, and by 69, certainly, it was not looking good. It had passed, by the way, with overwhelming uh, support from both Democrats and Republicans, but Democrats soon started to bolt with their support after they heard about the public criticisms. 
Um, again, some of those criticisms emerge from the fact that uh, only 44.2% uh, of former inpatients um, could say they had not reverted to drug use. Now today, knowing what we know, we might say 44.2% is pretty good coming straight out of a program. Um, but then when everyone expected 100% cure, that was surely a bad, um, a bad idea or a bad, bad finding. And then finally, uh, there were legal challenges. The New York Legal Aid Society claimed to have letters from nearly a thousand people of abuse and sexual harassment from other patient inmates as well as the officers. And then there were uh, a number of court cases, two in particular, which challenged the NAC system on habeas corpus, forcing uh, habeas corpus reviews of some 5,000 patients. At which point, uh, in 1973 and 74, uh, the NAC system decided to release all but maybe but a, but a small number of the patients and then refer them to other programs, particularly methadone maintenance. And here is my... All right, oops. Okay, that was supposed to be a lot more dramatic. They were supposed to kind of fly in. <laughs> that was like my big trick, too. Um, uh, when some lose some. Um, all right, so there are two conclusions here. One is that the political failure uh, uh, just really looked bad for the, uh, for the Rockefeller administration. I, and this is where Jalili is going to pick up and talk about some more of that lead-up history and the immediate uh, period after the passage of the Rockefeller drug laws. Uh, so I'll, I'll leave that alone. But another interesting point is what this meant, and I'd be happy to talk about this more in the Q&A, that there emerges a dialectical relationship between methadone maintenance treatment and, and uh, mass incarceration in the name of drug laws. And it's not a very easily ascertained or discerned one. Um, and I certainly don't mean to imply that methadone maintenance treatment on its own it has done this to us. In fact, it's really the politics of it. And this is to say this, that many of, of the non-medical proponents of methadone maintenance in the mid and late 1960s really heralded it as not necessarily as, th as a therapy, but as an anti-crime um, measure. And so you saw, you saw many conservative Democrats and Republicans who had no idea of what addiction was except that it was junkies stealing cars and radios, et cetera, et cetera, said if this is what's going to stop them from doing so, then that's fine. And they, the, the subtleties of addiction treatment medicine uh, were lost on them. It, but at, on the other hand, it also gave uh, Rockefeller and his supporters with the drug laws this idea that, well, since we do have a chemical cure for addiction, anyone perforce who is using opioids or opiates uh, is therefore a criminal. You have no excuse. Medicalization is out the window. Keep in mind, this is before a third position would emerge in the 1980s with HIV, uh, and that would be harm reduction. Uh, all this came before that, unfortunately, uh, but it's here where that story ends. Thank you very much. I was hoping to have the picture of Rockefeller behind me, but no, I'm just kidding. Uh, I want to start off by thanking Columbia, the organizers, and the and host this event, but also particularly Sam, because I know this was a huge undertaking, and it's a profoundly inspiring com uh, conference in service of a very important conversation, and it's really an honor to be part of this panel and to be part of the conference. So what I wanted to do in this presentation is take up where Sam left off, and examine the passage of the Rockefeller Drug Laws. And I probably don't have to convince this group that this is important history, but the Rockefeller Drug Laws were important at the time that they were passed. They were the harshest drug laws in the nation. Uh, they're viewed imp imp as important in the sort of national story of the modern war on drugs uh, because they're viewed as sort of this opening salvo, this first, this first shot in the modern war on drugs. I'm not sure it really makes sense for us to divide up the various wars on drugs, but that's another conversation. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to take seriously the title of the conference, which is Challenging Punishment, and sort of take that as a charge to think about uh, sort of how academics can contribute to this conversation. Um, we certainly can't do everything but <laughs> in any way, but uh, I was thinking how can, we how, how can we challenge punishment? And uh, one way is I think to show that the ways the punishment doesn't work. And another way is to talk about and think about the ways that punishment works. And by that, of course, I mean works for certain people and in certain ways. Um, obviously, punishment doesn't work in a lot of the ways that one would think one would measure a response to drug use. For drug, the drug use declines in 
crime, to the well-being of communities, of families, of drug users. So it doesn't work in those ways. But we have, we, as, as regards to the Rockefeller drug laws, we've literally had reports for decades that ex establish that there's. Um, so I so I think there, there's a conversation to, to be had about where we need to explain the persistence of these laws in the face of this failure and in the face of, de of decades of fervent political organizing against these laws. Um, so there's a lot of important ways that I could to, to trace this history. I'm gonna focus on Rockefeller's explanations themselves. Uh, and I'm gonna say, and this is again building on a lot of what Sam was saying, which is I think these punitive, these laws make sense uh, if you look at them, I mean, I don't think they make, make sense, probably not the right word, but they make the most sense if you look at them as a political response to a post of political crises uh, facing the state and the governor. And the governor in particular, that's obviously the person I'm focusing on right now. And I'm going to suggest that the laws help resolve these crises by forwarding particular explanations of social problems, empowering certain groups and marginalizing others. And, and the, the proponents of these laws argued for them on the grounds that there was a common sense that punishment was the inevitable response to the given <laughs> levels of drug use and crime at that historical moment. And what I want to suggest is that actually enacting these punishing laws did political work of producing that common, common sense. Uh, so that these laws were, were an effort to put forward, I think, actually two intertwined, uh, two intertwined fa uh, fallacies, essentially. Um, one is that everything had been tried and that drug treatment or, or strategies to assimilate drug users had failed. And two, that the inevitable and only response at that moment would be to embrace punishment. These were the, this is sort of the political work of these projects that I'm gonna suggest. Uh, now, actually, I think that punishment the common sense of punishment was not the case at this moment. I mean, we are talking about a moment when a huge number of people believed that the prison was going to wither away. This was a really circulating belief. The prison, the prison as we know, was going to sort of was going to float away. The sec I mean, Mayor Lindsay at this in 1972 was floating the idea of heroin maintenance clinics. So there wasn't a closed conversation uh, at this at, at this moment about what was the obvious response to drug use. Now, I'm not saying punishment wasn't popular. Punishment tends to be popular in lots of different periods, but it was by no means common sense. So I want to suggest that punishment had two, pro two profound accomplishments. And I don't think these are all, but these are the things I'd sort of like to offer up to the conversation. Uh, that they were part of a long historical process of managing the circle of exclusion in American society that they basically severed state responsibility to the, for the well-being of drug users, um, essentially casting drug users out of the polity. And second, that it advanced a different muscular vision of state authority that was unburdened by the baggage of liberal social pro programs. So, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to back up and briefly revi like revisit these political crises uh, that, that I would say that were going on in the 1960s, and then talk about how I think the laws resolve some of them. So, as Sam has set up, and I'm not going to go into this long, New York responded to these reports of mounting drug use, and there's a lot, a huge amount of concern about addict street crime by experimenting with these series of programs. There were therapeutic programs, there were the compulsory commitment programs that, that Sam was talking about, and also then there was the methadone programs. And these were huge state investments. They were, I mean, they were massive, and to make these state investments, uh, they, they necessitated big political promises. And these, the political promises of these programs were, I would say, twofold. The first, or, I mean, even at the time people talked about it as twofold. The first, and I think probably more dominant, was actually to, is that majorly screaming at you? Um, <laughs> the first was to reduce crime. Uh, and it, this was often talked about in terms of sweeping addicts from the street. The, the second was to cure and rehabilitate addicts. Um, and so what I'm gonna suggest is basically the treatment failed politically on both counts, and they failed to reduce crime rates, especially 
electorally convenient intervals. Uh, they failed to transform addicts, all, all the addicts into sober individuals. And uh, Sam, of course, talked about that. Uh, another political complication that I think is interesting is that the state is, is that activists and drug users used the state commitment to rehabilitation, and they started using this promise to, to advocate for their own programs that were that were had that forwarded their own vision of rehabilitation that were more directly accountable and. This was, could be a kind of a political headache. So, for example, when members of the activists and groups of the Young Lords took over and set up a detox center in uh, Lincoln, Lincoln Hospital that trained people to be political organizers, that wasn't exactly what Rockefeller had in, had in mind. So, um, so, two other brief challenges I want to mention that, that intensified the political, so this, this political drama. Uh, first off, <laughs> Richard Pryor has this quote, it's actually from later, but it's from his stand-up in the 1980s, but the quote is, I might not have it actually, absolutely right. They call it an epidemic now, white people are using it. So <laughs> that's basically uh, what started happening in the, 19, in the mid 1960s. There were growing reports of heroin and use in, by whites and suburban users, and this was very disturbing, and it was acknowledged in like a white, there was a hubbub because it was an actual official to a White House hearing said, he said that he, as long as heroin was a problem isolated to the ghetto, it was a problem we could live with. So, so even when Rockefeller talked about this issue, he, he, as, as, a, as opposed to revising the frame that maybe drug use is, is a problem of only certain communities, he actually described it as, he sort of used this as a way to double down on the idea that drug, the drug problem came from poor communities of color. So, you know, in 1966, he says, narcotic addicts are, are responsible for one half of the crimes committed in New York City alone, and their evil contagion is spreading to the suburbs. So you have this rhetoric which is consistent, which is that drugs are presented as indigenous to cities, and then they were imagined as a disease, it's again this contagion theme that we're hearing, um, that they're, they're imagined as a disease that's spreading from its sort of traditional natural ecosystem. Um, and a part of a lot of this work is a, you, you see it reflected in this obsession with the word pushers. Every there's, a, and so pushers, of course, is reflecting this idea that, that low low level drug sellers are running around foisting drugs on a, on you know on other populations. And so this not only naturalizes heroin use in poor communities; it's sort of normal in the way that it should be, but it obscures the popularity of white drugs, of other white drugs and that we heard about in the last panel that, was going, that of course has been a constant feature. Um, and of course the last political crisis that I want to mention is, is what we all sort of know and it's, uh, it was a personal crisis for Rockefeller which is that he wanted to be president really badly, um, really badly. And the problem there was that he was seen as a moderate and increasingly conservative party. Uh, he had been booed in 1964 by the Goldwater supporters. So, Things were not looking good for him, and so there was a lot of talk about how he needed to tack right uh, to stay in the game. So it's sort of in this context that Rockefeller first publicly unveils his proposal. And he does it in his, uh, the State of the State speech in 1973. And he starts by saying, it is time for brutal honesty regarding narcotics addiction. In this state, we've allotted over $1 billion of every, to, to every form of education against drugs and treatment of the addicts through commitment, therapy, and rehabilitation. But let's be frank. Let's tell it like it is. We have achieved very little permanent rehabilitation and we have found no cure. So he then proposed to make a penalty of the sale of hard drugs, regardless of quantity, a lifetime in prison without any probation, parole, or plea bargaining. So, I mean, so of course, when the legislature passed the law a few months later, it was mildly watered down, but it's important to note, the original call was for complete exile to prison, total banishment. And he posited this as this dramatic conversion that he sort of, he'd seen the light, and, and obviously, it goes without saying, physical, political, social expulsion is different than prison. I'm not saying it's the same thing. But, but, but his rhetoric allied to the way that these, strat these strat strategies weren't, really, weren't necessarily opposites, nor mutually exclusive. And obviously, we know that the history of medicalization and criminalization have been historically intertwined, that both conceptualize drug abuse as arising from individual pathology, and both tend to see the, the key state intervention as intervening in the individual. Um, so the way that these politics unfolded 
they actually framed the range of debate between treatment, as co which was usually co which was coerced usually, um, and punishment. This was the this was where the circle got drawn in a lot of the discourse. And so this is part. This was part of again getting back to some of the political work. It pushed outside of this binary other discussions that were very much on board: legalization, heroin maintenance, revolution. I mean, jobs. <laughs> Policing. I mean, there was a lot. You know, there was a lot of other uh, things throwing being on the table, and and it depended upon the whole proposal depended on creating um, this on this notion that, that there had been total failure in the in in these programs. And again, I'm not saying that they, in any way they were great, but this was the key. This was the key building block. And so Rockefeller would say, "Oh, these are drastic measures," and he'd acknowledge. But I am thoroughly convinced after trying everything else that nothing will work. And now what's, re what's remarkable about this language as a historian who needs to desperately believe that the past matters is that it completely elides the, the actual, what was common, not common, what was widely accepted that mandatory minimums had failed. And when I say that they had, people thought that they had failed, it wasn't the history of ancient Greece, like drug policy in ancient Greece. It was 10 years earlier, it was 1950s. So this, and people were, people during these debates would point to this. So an, an assemblyman during the debate said, the governor stated, we have tried everything in the drug field and it's all failed. Mr. Speaker, nothing could be further from the truth. It would be more accurate to say in the drug field that we have tried almost nothing. And he actually, and here he's insist, he insists that, that, that criminalization was actually the tried and failed response to most of drugs. And he said, he goes, well, a lot of some drugs. Um, so he goes on to say, there's not any evidence anywhere to suggest that the concept of deterrent has the slightest effect in the drug field. I think our experiences have actually proven that time and time again. Um, so if there's little reason to, if Rockefeller has not a lot of reason to assume this is going to be a hugely programmatically successful, uh, why do this? And I, there's a lot of different ways to tackle this question, but I think it's kind of fun to look at um, the, the explanation that Rockefeller himself gave. And his story begins at a party in 1972 where he's hanging out with uh, a man named William Fine, who is the head of Bowit, Bowit, is that what they're called? The, uh, it's the department store? I may not have it exactly right. Uh, and he, there, and his, this fine son had wrestled with addiction. He cared deeply about the issue, and he asks. So, so Rockefeller asks Fine to go to Japan and find out why was there the lowest level of addiction in any uh, industrialized country? Why it was in Japan? So Fine spends a weekend in Japan, comes back, files his report, and uh, which had lots of different aspects of Jap the Japanese program. And from from that report, right, that's where Rockefeller would fixate on this life sentences for drug pushers theory. And now, did Rockefeller need to send someone to Japan to get the idea of long mandatory minimums? No, I don't think so. Uh, but, but, but Fine's report is interesting because it actually emphasizes another lesson. And his, another sort of lesson I think is circulating and relevant here. So he, his report said, the thing that impressed me most of all, this is in the Japan case, is the single-minded conviction that they have that public interest is above human rights when it comes to an evil. So therefore, the human rights of those who get involved in narcotics or push narcotics are brushed aside quickly, aggressively, and with little or no recourse. So I don't know if that's a fair characterization of Japanese drug policy, and maybe someone can tell me, um, but I, I think this theme of willingly, almost deliberately sacrificing the rights of addicts uh, particularly pushers, becomes key in these proposals. And these, these debates were saturated with the, these claims that, that the wrong people had rights and that addicts had all the rights. And, it, and, and the notion that the expansion of the rights for drug users was, it was in a zero-sum relationship with norm, normative citizens. So as, as, as these people were to gain rights, I, the normative citizen is losing them. And here's where I, I see a key part of the work of, these, of, of this punishment, because you can't understand the point, I mean, it's, it probably goes without saying, but the poignancy of that rights debate at this particular moment cannot be understated. We're talking about a moment in US history when movements were, were demanding and drastically renegotiating uh, the questions of rights in, in, in American society. Okay, I'm off. Okay, so one more minute. Uh, so, so, these, so I'm arguing that these, this work of this punishment is intimately tied up with the process of negotiating, of negating rights claims.
Uh, I have a story about Rockefeller and Ronald Reagan, which I'll skip, but um, so to wrap up, it's actually kind of awesome, but uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> no, 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 I, offline, okay, um, so he, I've been out with this man's serious about his time, you have to respect that. Um, so to wrap up, these drug laws may not have worked programmatically, but they did political work. And all over the country, people explained Rockefeller's continued viability uh, as a Republican, as a Republican presidential candidate, based on his the brutal retaking of Attica, cracking down on welfare cheaters, and often the sort of cherry on top was passing the toughest drug laws in the country. So he didn't capture the presidency, uh, but Gerald Ford did appoint him as vice president after Nixon resigned, re resigned in 74. But I think probably the more sort of important uh, accompli accomplishment was more at an abstract level. And, and I think in th at this political moment, they signaled, the laws signaled a, a move from a policy that had been rhetorically committed to reintegrating drug addicts to a policy of social expulsion. And this move rhetorically absolved the state of accountability to groups of its most marginalized citizens. So no one could come and attack Rockefeller because drug users were having a hard time. This was, it, it changed the sort of parameter of success. Um, and through these tough laws, Rockefeller asserted a different, a, a particular vision of government. He painted a picture of a powerful and a vengeful state that was unburdened again by the legacy, by, by a lot of the crisis, um, what people, some people will call like a crisis of liberalism, um, and specifically his own therapeutic programs, the political baggage of his own therapeutic programs. Now since the uh, pusher that's targeted by these laws is widely understood to be an African-American and Puerto Rican man, these policies had implications, at, you know, as I just mentioned, at a time when society wrestled over demands, activist demands for racial justice, and as new groups threatened to use the state's therapeutic commitment as connected to and inspired by these other movements, um, these laws, based, the, these laws reputed any obligation to the well-being of low-level drug sellers, called for their quarantine and political exile. So these laws were, became an early illustration of the political utility, political utility of punishment and helped ensure the dominance of punitive social policy for decades to come. Thank you very much. one. I'm going to try to move through this fairly quickly because uh, I want to I get to the Q&A because there were so many good questions with some of the other presentations and I'm sure you all have questions now. I'm going to try something I haven't quite done before which is to in 12 minutes probably I say 12 and I'll be 14 move through a number of slides so I'm actually just going to try to move through this quickly um, in the hopes to get to the Q&A so bear with me and if there's questions about it you can talk to me afterwards or during the Q&A. Uh, so we've heard quite a bit here about the sort of context that we're in, the history of the drug laws in New York and around the country, and, uh, and Sasha's sort of broader context about what poverty means, which is, I think, important to some of the things that Dr. Hart was saying this morning about the context of what happens when people are using and so forth, uh, and Sam's conversation about what was going on with treatment here in New York, and Julie Lee talking about how as that system failed, Rockefeller turned towards something. So today, 40 years out, how, what would our drug policy be? And if I had to pick one picture to distill it, I would choose this one. And I realize this is not all encompassing. Um, this is, leaves a lot out. But overall, the dominant paradigm, to use that term deliberately, of our drug policy in the United States today is this. And we see that even when Obama and the administration, which is doing interesting things on drug policy now, even when they talk about taking a public health approach, they talk about it in this paradigm. Because even when we have a diversion program like a drug court, you have to go through this before you get to treatment. Nobody who has cancer is gonna get handcuffed before they get something that is otherwise a health, a health issue dealt with. So how is it a health issue if you gotta deal with this first? This is still our paradigm. And you know, the war on drugs launched in 71. We've heard a lot about this today. You can see this spike in incarceration, and it's fairly dramatic. The interesting thing to me about this and about New York, where we live today, is that, as Julili noted and others, 
Rockefeller did something in New York that is unique and we helped us as a state stand out, perhaps not in a way we would like, which is Nixon launches this war on drugs. I want a war on drugs. But it's not until New York in 1973 that that war takes shape. Rockefeller provides the architecture for what this war is gonna look like all the way up until today. That architecture was adopted state by state by state all over this country until Reagan picked it up and ran with it in the 80s. Now, in New York, we reformed the Rockefeller drug laws in 2009, uh, but you can see this is a pretty dramatic rendering of the number of people who were incarcerated under those laws. There's people here in the room like Dr. Drucker and Deborah Small and others who have spent a long time working to both them help us understand the impact of these uh, laws and policies and work to change them. Uh, but you can see we had 200,000 people incarcerated under these laws here in New York. That's no small figure by any measure. And now, of course, the implications of an incarceration practice like that, whether it's here in New York or at the national level, these are national figures, is significant, right? This is just a chart showing the number of people who have parents who are incarcerated. And we're talking about using the drug war as a way to deal with drugs and drug use, and we're going to incarcerate and arrest all these people. We're also talking about their families. That's why we have this crisis today, the children with incarcerated parents. And when you look at New York, specifically some of these communities where the concentration of incarceration is pretty vivid, what's particularly interesting about this, in my view, is that if we were to take maps, this is from my colleague, Dr. Uh, Ruth Finkelstein at the New York Academy of Medicine, she pointed this out to me. If we were to take maps and overlay a map of, say, asthma rates, poverty rates, cancer rates, high school dropout rates, you would find that they're in the exact same communities that we have this high rates of incarceration, right? They're, they're actually strikingly similar. Dr. Uh, Drucker talks a lot about this in his recent book. Now, this is a community in Brownsville. Some of you may have heard about the million dollar block notion. The million dollar block notion is interesting because all those areas we get these very dark blocks are where we're spending, we as taxpayers, a million or three hundred and three three and a half million dollars for a block to incarcerate people. When we think about incarceration, when we think about these policies, we're also thinking about money and budgets. And imagine, for instance, what we could do at one of these blocks in Brownsville if we were to dump $3.5 million just in one square block area. Right now we're doing that, but it's for incarceration. This is not unusual. This is how it looks across the state of New York where incarceration rates are high, oftentimes as a result of these drug policies, and similar across the country. Now, oops, I'm going to hold on to that for a second. Now, a couple of things are important to note about the Rockefeller laws, which are that the Rockefeller laws were here in New York were formed in 2009. Now, that didn't just happen out of nowhere. It was the result of a long history of engagement by people from multiple sectors of society. Uh, you had in the early 90s a group of prisoners in Greenhaven Prison that started a think tank that studied the incarceration rates in the state of New York and came up with this concept of the seven neighborhoods it wasn't a concept. They looked at the incarceration rates and looked where people were coming into prison from. They said, look, it's seven neighborhoods in the city of New York that bear the brunt of these incarceration rates. That came from prisoners, people who were incarcerated. In the mid-90s, you get people like Tony Papa, who had been incarcerated on a drug charge. First time offense, fairly typical first time offense. He delivered a $500 package of uh, cocaine to a, to, to a sting operation, it turned out. Gets a 15 to life sentence ends up becoming a painter, paints his way out of prison in this remarkable story of self-advocacy. He gets clemency from the governor, and then he hits the streets and starts doing a street organizing campaign as a former prisoner to change the laws. That work with people who were incarcerated, people who were coming out, and various community folks, and then advocates and paid lawyers and syringe exchange programs and treatment providers, that created what we tend to refer to in a general terminology as a movement that led to those reforms in 09, because even before those reforms occurred, you had a fairly dramatic uh, shift in practice here in New York, right? You, you look at the incarceration rates in New York, they were going down starting in the year 2000 for drug offenses. Why? Because the context was changing, because people were demanding change, even though we couldn't win policy change in Albany until 2009, we were able me, I was only part of this in the latter periods. People, many of you probably in this room and many other folks, people whose names will probably never be written down in the history books, 
were able to engage in a movement to demand reform and end these laws. Now, the reforms themselves were significant. They didn't end the drug war or mass incarceration outright, but we shouldn't undermine the value that they have, right? The reforms in 2009 did four key things with the laws as they, as they existed at that time. They ended mandatory minimums for nearly all drug offenses. Prior to that period, if you were busted on a drug charge, you were gonna go to prison unless the prosecutor said you could go to a treatment program. The prosecutor held the power. That ended in 09, except for a few small areas of, of drug laws. That was significant. It reduced sentences. This was the second thing those reforms did, dramatically. You went from serving, say, an eight to 20 year bid or a 15 to life bid to looking at, say, one to seven. Not perfect by any measure, but certainly dramatically different than a 15 to life measure. It, it put determinate sentences back into the sentencing process. So instead of going in with life on the back end, you went in with, say, 12 years on the back end. Still far too much, but certainly different than life. The third thing it did was to expand significantly the access to alternatives to incarceration, including but not limited to drug treatment. There's a story about that to be told with regards to implementation of those reforms that's beyond the scope of this discussion, but uh, if you're interested in that, talk to me afterwards. The fourth thing that it did is that it included a provision for resentencing for over a thousand people, meaning over a thousand people could petition the court for resentencing and release. Hundreds upon hundreds did. It's a form of decarceration. These reforms were significant, and when they passed, they hit the news at the national level with all sorts of states saying, wait a second, we followed what this state did back, way back when, and now they're basically overhauling this entire system. That's significant. One of the ways that we won those reforms, and by we, I mean a whole host of organizations, uh, one of the ways that those reforms happened was by changing what the demand was. Instead of demanding simple policy reforms, I'm not being demeaning by saying simple, instead of saying we want treatment instead of incarceration, or we want less sentences, we said this paradigm is broken. This criminalization paradigm no longer works. It's interesting, given Julie's uh, presentation, that the notion of a paradigm that Rockefeller was implementing in 73, treatment doesn't work, we need to move towards criminalization. We did something strikingly similar in 2009. It took a long time to get there, and there's a whole history unto that move unto itself, but that's what happened. That was the demand. We said, we need a public health approach. This criminalization approach has failed. Now, the reforms happened in 09, and what's happened here in New York since then is interesting. The implementation of those reforms really require a lot more engagement. Um, and as a, as, a, as a movement, as a field, as people interested in policy reform, I, I just want to flag here that implementation of any reform will likely determine the, the long-term value of that reform. So we, shouldn't, we should be happy when we pass something, but we've got to remember that more work is to be done. Today, though, we have another issue dealing with that shows why the drug war certainly here in New York is not ending and is as part of a national trend. Out of the 1.6 million drug arrests across the country, roughly half of them are for marijuana possession. Uh, and, yeah, nearly, and nearly all of the marijuana arrests, rather, for marijuana possession, or half of all of the drug arrests are for marijuana. And here in New York, you'll see from this slide from the ACLU, we have the highest number of marijuana possession arrests anywhere in the country, dramatically higher even than Texas. Now, this is work that uh, Deborah Peterson, Peterson Small has done with uh, Harry Levine and, and, uh, and put this on the map, which is looking at what's going on here in New York City. The marijuana laws changed in 1977. They decriminalized marijuana. You see that there weren't that many arrests happening until the early 90s when policing practices changed. Today, marijuana possession is the number one arrest here in the city of New York, the number one. Now, it would be interesting if those arrests were being done in an equitable way, but as this chart will show pretty clearly, they're not. The people who are using marijuana predominantly look like me. The people who are getting arrested don't. That's pretty common with what happened with the Rockefeller drug laws and with the rest of our drug policies. It doesn't mean white people aren't getting arrested, it just means we're less likely to. Um, and we're spending a significant number of police time on those practices. We issued a report earlier this year showing that there's about a million hours over the past 10 years that the police have invested into making these marijuana possession arrests. Imagine what that might cost, and imagine what we could do with a million hours of, of uh, uh, support, say, from public folks working for the public, teachers, for example. I'd much prefer that. Now, to change, just like the, the, the Rockefeller laws, and this is where I'm going to end and take us out, is like, what can we do, right? All this stuff is really crappy. It's a complete shit show. What is it can we do that actually will move us towards something different here? 
Now on the marijuana arrest campaign, we've spent a lot of time trying to build a campaign out that does not demand treatment for people being arrested for marijuana. It does not demand that the people don't get or get a diversion program. It would just say stop arresting them, period. And now that creates its own challenge, which is interesting, but these are some pictures from rallies that we've done with our partners at Vocal and the Center for New Leadership, whose leadership of the Center for New Leadership were some of the folks in that Greenhaven facility who helped popularize this notion of the seven neighborhoods, right? Formerly incarcerated folks who are doing think tank work and policy reform work. These are some of the actions that we've done here. Um, this is, I, this guy came and he was one of our interns after this. I was like, who is this white dude? And he's, I, I like that he has at least enough consciousness to show up like this to the rally. Uh, but the point is, in order to change these things, we've got to get up and move. We can't be sitting down and waiting for things to happen. We certainly can't expect Obama administration or Pataki or, or day. Uh, Cuomo or any of the new mayor to do it. We got to push them to do it. Now, this is where that's in Albany. Congressman Jeffries, who was an assemblyman who was leading this fight with us. These are all pictures from actions that we've done on the marijuana arrest issue. We were using the Tale Two City story before de Blasio was, but I don't think we can take credit for that. Um, I'd like to. We got a bunch of white people to try to get arrested in front of the NYPD and in some apropos moment, they didn't have enough officers actually to make the arrest, so quite literally, we had white people doing a solidarity action to get arrested in civil disobedience to protest racially biased policing practices, and there weren't enough police to arrest them. It's like we can't even get arrested when we want to on this issue, you know? Um, it was my colleague Evan Goldstein who was up. So where do we go from here? We think, as the, as the Drug Policy Alliance and my colleague Dr. Netherland uh, uh, noted this earlier, we need a, what we're calling a public health and safety approach to drug policy. It, we're using that as a paradigm frame. We can argue about whether that's good or not, but what we're basically saying is we have to move beyond simple policy demands and begin demanding a different paradigm. We need to demand a different way to think about drugs and drug policy that allows us to address the really egregious harms that have been institutionalized over the last 40 years. Whatever we do has to take into account mass incarceration, racial disparities, the fiscal waste, and the stigmatization of drug use and drug users. We have, we did this report, the blueprint, Julie talked about it earlier. There's stuff in, I think, in the front that talks about it. This is the basic gist of what the blueprint does. It says, we need all sectors to come together. There needs to be culturally, uh, there needs to be a cultural context to the policies that we put into place. Uh, we need integration across various silos. We need evidence-based policies. And we need the people who are impacted by those policies to play a significant role in the creation of them. It's pretty basic stuff, but trying to implement that at the city or state level is our challenge in our view. And that's where we think we need to go next. The final thing I'll say about what else needs to happen, so one is action. We gotta get up and move. We have to demand change, either through protest, we, these conferences like this. We have to have some kind of paradigm shift and call for that paradigm shift is the second thing. And then the third is that we need to challenge ourselves to really do different, address this issue of drugs and drug policy in a different way. If we attempt to move forward without looking at the individual biases that we carry in ourselves about drugs, the notion that say heroin is a bad drug and tobacco or alcohol is a fine or a better drug, those notions are going to destroy our ability to effectuate a positive change. We don't have to like drugs or we could like them a lot. For some people, they bring a great amount of pleasure. But if we don't deal with this notion of that drugs are gonna be in our lives no matter what, we need to find a way to live with that so we have the greatest possible harm and the least possible, greatest possible good, <laughs> maybe that'll edit that out at the TV, the greatest possible good and the least possible harm can come from them. Uh, I think those three things will help us move along in a new direction. Thank you. have been terrific papers. Uh, it's 5.30. This panel is scheduled to end at 5.40, but we are extending it till 6 by executive order. That's Sam's order. I'm the messenger. Uh, but we started about 20 minutes late, so uh, I want to do just a couple things. One, I want to share something that I think um, asks maybe the question that is the elephant in the room, um, and one that I want love the panelists to respond to. I think it captures the range of themes rooted to the past, but tied to the present that they address. Um, so I'm going to frame this statement by asking the question, why didn't the war on drugs actually succeed? And Jalili touches, or at least approaches this question in her prepared 
comments, uh, but we didn't hear as much about it. And I want to I want to ask or extend that question um, to all of the panelists because when I listen to Sasha's address, when he talks about the lack of empathy for the poor, uh, when we hear Sam talking about the transition from medical Criminalization to criminalization, and of course, when we hear Gabriel both celebrating recent accomplishments, but reminding us of uh, even in this moment of of accomplishment, we see tremendous retrenchment around marijuana. I mean, we got that right 30 years ago. Um, I want to I want to play with the notion that the war on drugs and the war on crime did exactly what they were supposed to do, which is to respond to this huge rights revolution that unleashed the potential for pre previously marginalized non-citizens to fully participate in the body politic. Um, and that it was incredibly effective. And that at some point its effectiveness ran up against the costs of doing that kind of business. I, I want the panelists to wrestle with that because I think the framing of their comments uh, exists within what I worry about is a little bit of a kind of liberal left echo chamber where we remind ourselves how bad this problem is. Um, Gabriel has a moment in his, his remarks where he very casually says it's never been about the facts and yet here he presents us in most of his time with the facts. Uh, Sasha gives us the kind of humanistic voice of those facts but I would submit to all of you that we've all heard the facts and yet we can't get past them. So maybe we ought to play a little bit with the ideas and the messiness of those ideas that frame the context of, I've heard the crisis of liberalism, we've heard this issue of the way the notions of relapse become a measure of the failure of addiction policies, and I'd like to play with that a little bit because, and this comes up in at least two of the papers, uh, the failure of earlier rehabilitative approaches um, to to drug addiction, but that same notion of measuring the success or failure of social policy can be defined as relapse or recidivism, both of which are predicated not just on some universal standard that we might all say is a reasonable way of judging a program, but they all are tied to how we spend money. They are tied to how we use resources, and resources for what purpose? To what is the point of spending money on people who we've decide, defined as morally corrupt and undeserving. And in a context where the American dream or American exceptionalism defines the individual as the unit of measurement, we could reasonably expect and limit to how much money we're going to spend on an individual who chooses not to pull themselves up by their bootstraps. So that's the framework. Um, and now I'm going to read something that we've all heard, but I think it could not be more apropos in this moment. So Bill O'Reilly, in response to President Obama's speech about the tragedy of the Zimmerman verdict, gives his usual talking points memo directed here to the President. Many of you have heard these, but I suspect a few of you have not. And so I want to read just a couple of snippets here. So he, he begins by quoting the President and his speech about the Zimmerman verdict and the pain of the African American community and trying to explain to white America why they have a different take on the outcome of the verdict. And then O'Reilly says, it was wrong for Zimmerman to confront Martin based on his appearance, blah, blah, blah. But here is the headline. Young black men commit homicides at a rate 10 times greater than whites and Hispanics combined. When presented with damning evidence like that and like the many holocausts in Chicago where hundreds of African Americans are murdered each year, the civil rights industry looks the other way and makes excuses. They blame guns, poor education, lack of jobs. Rarely do they define the problem accurately. So here it is. The reason there is so much violence and chaos in the black precincts is the disintegration of the African American family. He goes on to cite statistics. Right now, the percentage of black babies out of wedlock is 73%. That drives poverty. And the lack of fathers to young boys growing resentful and unsupervised, that leads to crime. White people don't force black people to have babies out of wedlock. That is a personal decision, a decision that has devastated millions of children and led to disaster both socially and economically. So raised without much structure, young black men often reject education, gravitate towards, gravitate towards the street culture, drugs, hustling, gangs. Nobody forces them to do that. Again, it is a personal decision. And then there is the drug situation. Go to Detroit, 
and ask anyone living on the south side of the Eight Mile Road what destroyed their city. They will tell you narcotics. Now he is citing black people in their own communities. They know addiction leads to crime and debasement. But what do the race hustlers and limousine liberals yell about? The number of black men in prison for selling drugs? Oh, it's so unfair. It's a nonviolent crime and blacks are targeted. That is one of the biggest lies in the history of this country. The thugs who sell hard drugs, no matter what color they are, deserve to be put away for long periods of time. They sell poison. They sell a product that enslaves and kills. They are scum. It strikes me if we are not willing to wrestle with the complexity of the range of ideas and arguments that actually live and breathe in America, and I would argue, short of the budget problem, define much of the public discourse, not the academic one, not the policy one, not the advocacy one, not the public health one, but much of the public discourse in dealing with this, because I hear too many liberals who say, I pay no attention to what the neocons say, I don't watch Fox News, I can't put up with it. Well, it seems to me that we're not addressing the real world as it exists. And probably, far as I can tell, defines much of the discomfort and ambivalence shown by the Obama administration on drug policy over the last six years. Finally, I would say that I had a terrific conversation with Deborah Smalls before coming, Deborah Small before coming up here, and it, it helped me to think about what I might add to this conversation that I think will push us all to be more mindful of the different kinds of audiences that we speak to and the different kinds of places that we put our voices in. And she and I both agree that there is a silent black majority that essentially co-signs on what Bill O'Reilly thinks are the origins of these problems and would see this kind of work as essentially pro not just problematic, but part of the problem. Need I even mention Don Lemon's response to Bill O'Reilly on CNN, essentially co-signing unequivocally on everything that Bill O'Reilly said. So there you have it, my two cents. Panel, take it away. adventurous of the four of us. There's a lot going on there. Well, a, a framing question would be, how can history help to understand and upend the set of ideas that undergird, even when we have reform? Because it seems to me we're always ready to, to experience retreatment or to take three steps backwards when we've taken two steps forward. Right, yeah. Well, I think, and, um, just to maybe start the conversation on this, I think one of the things that history might show us is that it, in, in terms of two presidents in particular, those would be Richard Nixon and Ronald Reagan, the war on drugs had a, a political and ideological effect of, of really kind of cutting the liberal democratic coalition at the kneecaps, which is to say that by the 1970s and 80s, one of the backbones of the Democratic Party had been black urban voters, particularly who had union membership. And that had been solidified since the 1930s New Deal coalition. And so particularly with, I mean, kind of Reagan did things that, that, that Nixon only dreamed about. I'm not even sure he had the temerity to even dream about some of those things. But I mean, what, one thing that Reagan accomplished was in the, in the, in the cover of Law and Order and of, of pursuit of a drug war and this threat to, this moral threat to American society and the good people of the United States, I was able to, to under that cover, we do quite a bit of retrenchment in the welfare state. And he, and he was actually not abashed about it at all. He had announced you know, during his years as governor of California and, and in his first campaign for the presidency that he had planned to dismantle the New Deal state. And he found a good way to do that. That and you know, welfare queens, you know, his famous speech about there was a woman who apparently had, I don't know how many Cadillacs, and et cetera, et cetera, and, and had social security cards and numbers and welfare checks under how many names. And not only did that, you know, not only was that person not characteristic of any class of people, she didn't even exist. So I think in a lot of ways, I don't want to, I don't want to sound, you know, kind of, you know, mamby pampyish about it. In a lot of ways, kind of drug ideology has served as a cover for this kind of creative politics of, and I say creative because I don't want to describe it as all retrograde. I mean, these are some very creative individuals who came, you know, who developed these kind of political strategies. 
That's one way of dodging the question largely, <laughs> but I think you gave part of the an answer. Just a brief um, story. When we started doing the, the, this campaign around marijuana arrests a number of years ago, we went around and talked to, when I say we, I'm talking about my, my colleagues at the Drug Policy Alliance, many of them are here, Alexis and Julie, Cassandra, Melody, others. Uh, we went around and talked to dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of people, right? It's a typical campaign practice before you start that you do your field work to prep. And we, I found something really interesting, uh, which is that we talked to teachers and community board leaders and all kinds of folks, people who we knew wouldn't agree with us. Um, but when we met with the advocate organizations, housing, you know, uh, uh, pick your social justice issue here. I, I was surprised only momentarily about how um, unwilling many of them were to sign on to this campaign. And even now, we have a real difficulty getting groups to sign on to support a change in the marijuana laws and consider what moment we are in, right? Now, years ago, I just could sort of get it because they're nervous. They're, they're generally nervous. Like, ah, it's a drug thing. It's marijuana. Our members, our board, our staff, our, uh, okay. Well, now we've got a governor who has said we need to change the laws. We've got the entire city establishment has said we need to change the laws. There wasn't a mayoral candidate who didn't say we needed to fix the, the decriminalization law. And most of them said we needed to do more than that. The leading Republican candidate right now is actively saying we should legalize marijuana, right? That the moment has shifted, and yet we can't get even some of the folks who have been allies, like on Rockefeller, to a lot of these groups are allies. And, and, and it's my opinion, and I would put forth, the reason why is because at the bottom of it, we were saying, let's take these people and put them into treatment. And that people have not wrestled with what it means to just, want, like, people are using drugs, folks. That's, guess what? It's happening. And we're not going to do anything about it. People, have, people can't, re haven't wrestled with this. And so I would put forth that I think liberals have been as bad, if not worse, than the conservatives on this issue, number one. I think number two, we have long ago reached the limit of treatment instead of incarceration as an answer to the mass incarceration in the drug war. That was a novel concept in the early 90s that was launched here in New York and a good thing to do at that time. Politically, we are beyond it. We should be talking about decriminalization. We should be talking about that not for just marijuana, but for cocaine and for heroin, for the gambit of substances. We should be doing what they're doing in places like Portugal. And until, especially groups that are doing social justice work can grapple with this in a meaningful way, we are, I think, doomed to repeat these notions of essentially getting what, it, in my view, again, what it boils down to is saying, well, because that person uses drugs, they are somehow different than us, without ever acknowledging there's probably not a person in this room who has not been impacted by addiction or drug use. I mean, I myself was like a very heavy methamphetamine user for some time. And so we have to, one, talk about these things with each other. And two, we have to grapple with this notion of what it means that people are using and that there may not be a state-based response that is about mandated treatment that is the appropriate thing. And until we do that, I think we're going to be stuck. And the final thing I'll say to this is we, if we don't do all of that while talking about race and racism, then, then the whole thing is going to blow up in our face. All this marijuana legalization stuff that's going on across the country, we are going to run into serious problems if we don't start to instill some of those debates with questions about racial justice and racial equity and the and uh, piggyback on the previous comments and push a, a response from you that uh, I think will respond to the previous statements. Uh, it, it seems to me much of your body of work and certainly what you share with us today is not only uh, a, a kind of humanists cry for empathy as an organizing principle for how we should live our lives and govern our policies. Um, but I'm wondering if you imagine when you speak in such a way that your audience is conservative, um, or are they Reagan Democrats, or are they liberals, are they black social conservatives? I mean, do you imagine the world in so many different categories, and do you think sharpening your critique um, to suit a specific audience 
um, particularly of liberals, for example, would, would, would be more compelling, or is it already the case? Well, the answer is no disrespect, but I find talking to liberal audiences far less satisfying than talking to non-liberal audiences, because I know that on most issues, if I'm talking to a liberal audience, myself and the audience are going to agree. So it's kind of easy. It's much harder talking to a conservative audience. Um, what I found on drug policy especially, I can talk all I like about empathy. It's not going to be there with a conservative audience. But I can talk about finances and suddenly eyes open. And for years and years, I mean, I actually, this is the first time in about five years I've done a big talk on criminal justice. I've, I've focused much more on things like hunger in recent years. But it seems to me that the criminal justice side of the equation and the broader poverty side, they really are intimately related. And for many years, the language of empathy, you can take it back to Reagan, you can take it back to Nixon, you can take it back much further in some instances, but the language of empathy itself has been undermined. So I think you actually have to start with non-empathic language or non-humanist language. You have to start on dollars and cents, that for various reasons we've created a set of social mechanisms that are extraordinarily expensive to implement and really don't work. Um, coming back to what you were saying about Nixon, you know, it seems to me Nixon is the ultimate Machiavellian in American life. He's a brilliant Machiavellian. He clearly studied the prince and other sort of other texts about how to govern. And he knew how to divide and rule. And he knew how to do things that he didn't necessarily believe in but created wedge issues. And I have absolutely no confidence that Nixon believed in the morality of the war on drugs. He didn't shape policy around morality. That was secondary to him maybe third, tertiary, maybe it wasn't even a consideration at all. He was an amoral politician. But he knew the war on drugs was going to be effective. He knew it could create a series of divide issues between the Democrats and their base. And he used it brutally. What worries me even more than Nixonian Machiavellian politics is the fact that from Reagan onwards, conservatives actually started believing this nonsense. And that's even more dangerous because you've now got a generation of true believers who actually believe that policies like Just Say No are effective, and they're willing to put tens of billions of dollars into utterly misguided anti-poverty strategies, and then to say anyone who opposes them is un-American. It's this sort of cycle downwards in the political language. And I do think that there's a broader application, that that cycle downwards now applies to poverty politics as well. That Nixon actually, when you take away the rhetoric, actually did some rather interesting things around poverty. In some ways, he's more akin to Johnson on poverty than to Reagan, and he's certainly more akin to Johnson than he is to George Bush Sr. or to someone like um, Rush Limbaugh again today. These guys today are true believers in their own nonsense, and that's what scares me. Okay. Well, well, I'll just say, well, well, just one sentence. I'll say that his, I think one to answer the question: What can historians do? Or, or did it succeed? I mean, you, you more explicitly touch on this question: How did the war on drugs succeed? Well, and I wouldn't say I, I would say what, what work did it do? <laughs> the idea of war on drugs succeeds. Same sentence, hard. But, I, but yes, it succeeds in the sense that that it at a moment when this when the sort of <laughs> I had a moment when I was prepared to answer another question but I'm ready to do this. Um, I would argue that, as I basically articulated in the paper, which is that as a, at, at a moment when this circle of sort of who can claim the rights and belonging and voice in the polity, who the state is accountable to, is being pushed open, is being wrenched open, this is a series of strategies. I mean, as the criminal justice system is always used as a strategy to navigate the boundaries of citizen, you know, citizenship or belonging, these tools are used to, to, to re, redraw those boundaries. I wouldn't say they're, they're redrawn in the exact same way, but I think they're being, that these are technologies that are used to redraw social boundaries and who has voice. Kind of, so that's where I would think. Okay, question? Could we, could we ask a questioners to uh, state their name too before the okay. question, just All because right. we're videotaping this? Thank you. Uh, can you hear me okay? Okay. Uh, hi, my name is Gabriel Mendez. Uh, probably furthest uh, traveler here. I'm from uh, UC San Diego. Um, um, maybe there's some international. Anyway, um, I want to first thank all the panelists for some very thoughtful and informative presentations. Um, and uh, something in your question, um, the, uh, your moder the moderator, and in the um, presentations themselves, um, I would argue that there is a specter that haunts 
the papers as well, I mean the presentations as well as your question, and it's the figure of Daniel Patrick Moynihan. And um, the reason why I say that is not just the obvious uh, 1965 uh, Negro family case for national action, uh, and particularly the ways in which um, the, 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 the theme of pathology, whether it's been articulated or not, one way in the Bill O'Reilly, um, I'm gonna get to a question, but that, um, pr that previous to the 1965 report is a very important other report in 1963 when he was the Assistant Secretary of Labor, and that is this paper on the, called One Third of a Nation, which looks at the prospects for labor and looks at, he, that's where he first articulates this, or kind of rehashes Fra E. Franklin Fraser's um, you know, matriarchy thesis and the idea of the army as being a uh, source of rehabilitating uh, uh, the Negro male. And I bring this up because I want to think. I want to think about how you see this narrative, and then application of the concept of pathology, not necessarily the kind of biophysical pathology that exists within racialized peoples, but within the culture and psychology, and how you can using that kind of bio, switching now to the biomedical model of the kind of, okay. of depath. I I'm, I, come on, you, you spoke a long time. I can I'm articulate the my, my question. <laughs> we got you. Yeah. We got you. I'm, so ideas of pathology I'm, in this time period. There's more yeah, to I it. would That's say that, I, yeah, particularly in, in drug warrior rhetoric, Tangle of pathology, I think, I, I don't think I'm saying anything unique or special to say that it's shot through with that for the past four decades or so. I, I do want to push back on the question a bit. Recently, there's been a, a movement, an intellectual movement, to recover the Moynihan report for its more liberal aspects. But if, if you read the report, you, you'll also see that, yes, there is a discussion of labor, but there's not really a discussion of kind of labor formation or labor activism. So it's this kind of, it is a 1960s way of evacuating any sort of labor militancy that had emerged, particularly in black communities since the 1930s, and you could even say since A. Philip Randolph in the, in the teens and 20s, uh, and just kind of thinking that, well, government needs to just regulate the labor market and, and without a discussion about what people's investment in that. And that becomes a problem because then it, those kind of liberal arguments are easily, very quite easily lend themselves to conservative ones. So Dan Patrick Moynihan, who now you know rests in the pantheon of American liberals, you know, easily, if he decided, could kind of change his robes and go across the street and, and at least hang out with the, in the pantheon of conservatives in a lot of ways. So I, I, I push back a bit on that, but I, I do appreciate the complexity. Good afternoon, I'm Deborah Small from Break the Chains. Um, I have a question for two of the panelists that go specifically to the history that you recounted in the panel, which I thought was really good. And yet, I, I must admit that there were some questions that came up for me. And specifically, I wanted to talk about the overall frame that you guys have accepting sort of the assumption that drug treatment in New York in the 60s didn't work, and that that was the justification for the Rockefeller laws. And I say that because at the exact same time that Nelson Rockefeller was moving towards mandatory minimums, you had the same phenomenon of the federal government establishing compulsory treatment for returning vets under the rubric that it did work, and it was quite successful. So it seems to me that there's some inherent contradiction that on one hand, we have federal policy from 70 to 73 that was based on treating returning vets for heroin addiction on the basis that treatment would work and not locking them up and not going after the people that they were buying their drugs from. And at the same time in New York, you have the adoption of this draconian sentencing structure that was based on a structure that had just been rejected 10 years previously to deal with drugs and drug addiction. So it just seems to me that, the, that there was something more political going on than just the idea that drug treatment didn't work 
that justified why Rockefeller was able to do what he did. And then secondly, on the Nixon part, he was in fact the first and one of the few presidents that had a treatment first approach to dealing with the problem of substance abuse. Now we may not like the way in which he used it politically, but it hasn't been since him that we've had a president who's been willing to put uh, the majority of the resources behind treatment as opposed to law enforcement. And I do think that we need to both acknowledge that and look at what changed between Nixon and Reagan that gave us an escalation of the drug war from a law enforcement only perspective. And part of that had to do with the president in between. Thank you so much, Dr. Smalls. Um, uh, I, I heard two questions, Vietnam vets and the failure of treatment and then Nixon uh, and drug treatment policy. I would, I would point out that for Nixon, the, the problem that he and his administration feared was that you would have hundreds of thousands, or at least tens of thousands, of returning vets uh, who were uh, addicted to not just heroin, but very good heroin, very pure heroin uh, from the Golden Triangle, but then who were also weapons trained. And by the way, this was not disconnected from their fears that many of them, particularly uh, those who were poor and white or, or non-white, might join kind of insurrection, insurrectionary movements as well. Um, but then also, I think the idea of, of a lock them up and throw away the key approach simply doesn't work on veterans. I mean, just ideologically, it doesn't play out the way it did for Rockefeller. Now, that's, I'm, I'm, I'm playing a little free and loose with, with some of these categories and my generalizations. I just want to kind of point out some of the differences. But you're absolutely right that, uh, I, I, and I hope I did not mean, I hope I, I did not mean to imply that, that treatment was deemed to be a failure. This particular experiment of compulsory treatment was a political failure. No one really kind of, there really weren't very good measurements for what, what constituted a therapeutic success. And then in terms of Nixon, um, expanding treatment. You're absolutely right. Some historians have even, or at least one in particular, one historian has called him the therapeutic president. Um, and, and I don't think uh, they were being very ironic about that either. He did expand methadone maintenance treatment, for example, um, and, and started the first presidential level office on, special, on drug addiction treatment. So in that way, yeah, he, he was a very kind of, uh, uh, I think Sasha mentioned that Nixon looks a lot more like LBJ than he does like, I mean, even Reagan and certainly kind of a George W. Bush. And we kind of, I don't want to rehabilitate him, his image either, but we do need to, I mean, he doesn't need it, but you know, we do need to keep that in perspective. You were absolutely right about that. So we should not kind of throw him in the same category. Thank you. And I mean, maybe we can talk afterwards. I sort of feel like I was saying the same, I was sort of trying to say some of the same things that you were saying, which is that these are political, again, that these were, I actually think these are all very political categories and that the evaluation of treatment and even to group all treatment together was a very political move. I mean, I, so I would say that declaring treatment a failure and using that to rationalize the Rockefeller drug laws was a political move. And I don't think, I mean, although I don't think that <laughs> locking everybody up in weird prisons was, a, was effective, but there was a lot to be said for methadone. I mean, there was reports coming back on methadone at the moment that he instituted these laws. Yeah. They have meetings, like they supposedly, they had reports that drug use had been going down for two years when he institutes these laws. So I'm just, I'm sort of suspicious of whether, again, how much facts matter, you know, like I'm suspicious of even how, if, I mean, I don't know, even if the treatments had been really effective, for instance, methadone, we still had drug users enmeshed in public space, you know, and this is a political issue, not a, uh, you know, treatment issue. So I think that, the, the, so I, would, I think I agree with what you're saying. There it is. Um, I, I ran a uh, thousand, started and ran a thousand patient drug treatment program in the Bronx for 20 years. So I certainly can understand and appreciate the importance of treatment for those uh, and what treatment consisted of was giving a safer form of an opiate to people who'd become addicted to opiates, and that seems reasonable, since so many people were dying from it. Then along came AIDS, and even more so. We got a little relief in this. But I, I'm not sure this is about treatment. Uh, the, the, the point that uh, uh, Dr. Muhammad raises may be more about race. And any of you who haven't had the pleasure of reading his great book, uh, Condemnation of Blackness, We'll find a preview of this discussion in the, uh, in the development of social sciences, which exonerated white people for crimes as social, Officer Krupke, social disease, 
and continued and, and, and entrenched the view of crime in black communities as further evidence of the inferiority of black people. That was a deeper issue what was going on, which was the intention not only of slavery, but of, of genocide. And I, I smell a whiff of that in this situation, not in this room, I mean, but in the dispute about what are we gonna do about drugs. Uh, the Holocaust in Germany wasn't about Jews. It was a political project about power by the Nazi party. And I'm beginning to think that the project, seeing what's going on with the, in, in, in the politics of this country now, the attitude about health care, uh, the shift of huge portions of our treasury into a smaller and smaller fraction of the population, uh, I'm beginning to smell a similar kind of trend going on in this country. I think it's very hard for us to swallow because we live in these enclaves that are spared, and a lot of us are spared the worst of this. But what's going on here with this prison population and the inability to let go of it, because we're gonna test that soon in some way and we'll see how we're doing. But I don't think that it is about drugs or about drug treatment. I think it's about picking some group that happens to be black people for the, for the reasons of history in this society that we can deny basically a human status to. And that's the project that's going on around this, this, this debate about race, the people's health, and the war on drugs. It's much deeper than the issue of drugs. And so I guess my um, comment or question really goes hand in hand what it is that he's saying as well as what Sasha and Gabrielle um, have mentioned. And what I wanna know is how do we get white people, and I'm not talking about the white folks that's up in here, <laughs> the wise follower of white folks, the white folks who voted for Obama, I'm talking about the other 47% or the 90% of people in some southern states that did not vote for Obama to talk about issues of poverty and issues of race. Because as you mentioned, this is not just about, or about um, drug issues, it's about a super so, a structure, a racial structure that is in place. And people are not empathetic because as someone mentioned earlier, Earlier, we're othering people and we're able to other black people and Latinos because we're able to see them as different from white people. Now, I don't think that this conversation and the policies that we really want to see, and not even just the policies, but our society, a society that we want to see is going to truly manifest until we get people, people who are in control to talk about these issues in a real substantive way. So how do we get white people and the bourgeois black folk who to make made it through you know, elite institutions who think that meritocracy is truly at place to talk about these issues of class, poverty, and race. Thank you. Well, that's beautiful. And <laughs> I'll say one thing. I think this is an example. Now I've quoted Mao twice. I'm with you. Um, I think that there's a mil there has to be a million paths toward that question. And I think there's a million different answers. But I remember wrestling with that after doing organizing for years. And for me, my path is being a college professor, you know, which is people are locked, they have to deal with me. <laughs> and then I trick, I don't, I teach them classes that they I, they, I teach them drugs and alcohol and they think they're gonna, you know, like get to, I don't know, smoke pot or something. Sample the merchandise? <laughs> what? Okay. Yeah, but anyway, they, but so I'm just saying, I sort of deliberately try to recruit students that, you know, that aren't, that aren't in the, about, you know, new Jim Crow group. and. And although I want them in my class too, but I try to reach students. I try to automate, you know, start by kind of unpacking the idea of, me of, of meritocracy. Try to point out that like 20% of them would never have been considered white in different moments in history, you know? So I think education is, is one important way. Um, and I don't wanna, I mean, I could go on with lots of ideas, but I think it's a critical project. Uh, Sasha has some ideas. Yeah, yeah I, I, I think that one of the things that the body politic has suffered from in the last 30 or 40 years is this notion of wedge issues driving people apart for political gain, for one or another party to gain political gain. It seems to me that what you're hinting at is actually the reverse, that we have to find a way of unwedging the issues. So we have to find universal language that applies across demographics. And for me, in a sense, I'm going to give you an answer that's not about criminal justice and not about drugs. I would start with things like hunger. There are certain things that are now common experiences in this country. One in six Americans is poor. 47 million Americans, including vast numbers of white Americans, if we're talking about how to bring different demographics into the conversation. 47 million Americans are on food stamps. 
You go to any food pantry in a suburb or in an inner city, in an urban area or a rural area on a Saturday, and you're going to see lines round the block with hungry Americans of all colors and all ages looking for food. And that's actually an issue. It's one of the few issues that you can create huge, huge levels of common empathy around, which is why the Republicans aren't gaining traction on cutting food stamps. You can, get, you can beat up on welfare recipients. You can beat up on all kinds of people on all kinds of assistance. Once you start going after hungry kids and turning that into a policy platform, people get really morally uneasy. So I would say start with things like that. Show people what they have in common with their neighbor down the street or their colleague who lost their job, and then broaden the conversation. So it's a sort of reverse wedge issue thing. If you can universalize it on hunger, then maybe a year down the road, you can have a much more universal conversation on drugs or a much more universal conversation on the sanity or insanity of the prison complex. So that's how I'd start. I, I would also, and thank you for that question too, I would also add to that that it's really incumbent upon us to really make more sophisticated and update our arguments about race, uh, particularly where apparently the regnant neoliberal narrative is that we are you know, after race, post-racial. Um, and there's a, there's a way in which race can be cynically used. And, and one of the early questions, uh, actually, uh, it was Khalil's, one of his opening questions, uh, race can be cynically used by placing black faces, black bodies, to articulate conservative positions. And that befuddles a lot of people who do not who have not been exposed to a sophisticated analysis of what race is in the context of, of inequality and power. So I think, I, I, I actually, I don't think I've even answered the question, but I've, I've maybe just kind of said, said an amen to it, that this is a problem that, that we as thinkers and as activists need to address. We're gonna take one more question. Uh, we've got a response here, and then last question. And just really briefly, I a uh, colleague, uh, uh, Daryl Atkinson, who's a, a formerly our incarcerated lawyer out of North Carolina, said something very interesting once. He said, you know, I had to go to law school. I had to get three years of training for law school. A plumber has to have an apprentice for five years, an electrician for seven, a doctor for nine, so forth. Why don't we think about training ourselves around, to, around the ability to talk about race in the same way? And I think Onaje mentioned this in one of his comments earlier, that there's uh, organizations out there like the People's Institute for Survival and Beyond and others that actually do that. And I think, particularly for the, even for the people who voted for Obama, I would by no means, I can't speak on behalf of white people and won't, but I would by no means trust that the, people, the white people who voted for Obama understand anything about race at all. Um, uh, I think mean, most white people and probably and a lot of other folks too are just confused about race entirely. And so I think we, uh, our ability to train ourselves to have the conversation will I think enable us to be better organizers, which gets specifically to your question is, I don't know another way to do it except through organizing, but if somebody figures out a magic bullet to get white people to move on something, like I'm all ears. I just, I don't know a, another way to do it besides that kind of, you know, elbow grease of organizing. Just to chime in one second. I actually disagree with Sasha on this point, but I think we should be able to state publicly that we disagree. Um, I actually feel that universalism has gotten us into this mess, and it's been the trope that consistently fails to redistribute in a whatever fair way we could call it. It's not meritocracy in America. I mean, the New Deal would be the classic example, which not just redlined black folks out of it, but essentially became a carrot to white America um, that class inequality but would be resolved in their interest and not in the interest of racial minorities. Um, I also think that the Obama administration in more recent times, its own universalistic approach has proven to be incredibly difficult and to show few results in terms of dealing with the redistributive need in this country for dealing with the poorest amongst the poor. I also wonder that in uh, a future browning America, if America has always been about money, if commerce has been the driving force for development in this country, which it has been, I would argue, then what happens in a future where white people become the minority and colored people, particularly uh, Latinos and uh, uh, biracial and multiracial people um, who've not been trained, as Sam talks about, in the sophisticated ways of understanding race, see their own success and measures of opportunity as foreordained, as you know, in, uh, some form of neo-social Darwinism, right? Like 
you know, I made it, so can you. Um, so if we never interrogate the true racial history and the racial consequences of that history and the way in which universalism did not bind together the poor, it didn't work in the populist movement, it didn't work in the progressive era, it didn't work in the New Deal era when all those GI bills paid for education and white picket fence homeowners and those same people were throwing Molotov cocktails at black folks as they tried to live next door. We really have no moment in our history to recover as an evidence that universalism is an expected social policy. How are you doing? Um, my name is Sebastian. Good evening. Thank you, all the panelists. Um, seeing as how it's a panel on uh, the history of the drug war, um, where we came from, where we're at, and where we're going, I have a question about movement building. And um, two things stuck out with me. One of them is uh, the point about empathy, um, the gentleman in the middle made, and the other point about how changes on the state level affect the national level the gentleman that made it uh, in the middle. And I think about um, the seven neighborhood kind of theory and that all these ailments sort of amount to human rights violations. Um, and this goes as far back as uh, Malcolm X, um, who wanted to bring human rights violations on Afro-Americans to the United Nations. And um, you know, it makes me think of Guantanamo Bay and the prison situation there and the prison situation here in the United States. And you know, there's been a, a new news break about how they're force feeding people in Guantanamo Bay. Um, but I've heard that that has been done for decades here in uh, domestic prisons. Um, so basically what I'm wondering, and just, just using the example of Guantanamo Bay, I think about uh, movements on like a federal and national level, and I think, you know what, they lack, they lack sort of teeth and power. You know, we get things done on the state level. And at the same time, state level uh, movements with that teeth and power often lack empathy because we're working with constituents such as incarcerated black men or something and you know an, a white lady on the Upper West Side might not be down with a state movement um, that's helping only incarcerated black men. So I was wondering um, if uh, the panelists see a place for international organizations on the state level uh, in regards to enacting uh, national change as a result of enacting state change with international support and what the possible strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats of involving international constituencies in state level uh, movements would be. Thank you. I mean, I, for me, I'm all in favor if we can use the United Nations in any capacity to show flaws in the way that we do business, since we use the UN to show flaws in the way other people do business, I'm all in favor. So, for example, felon disenfranchisement. It breaks a myriad of international conventions. Solitary confinement breaks a myriad of international conventions on torture. Um, there's absolutely no reason we shouldn't use those to hold a mirror up to ourselves. I think uh, we did a conference in May up in Buffalo about drug policy issues, and we, we brought out to that conference a guy from Portugal who is a part of the Ministry of Health, and he spoke there about Portugal's policy of decriminalization. I want to make sure that folks understand that's not legalization. Um, drugs are still illegal, but the possession of any drug in Portugal, and that's what I was saying earlier, the term de decriminalization is similar to this. The possession of any drug, heroin, cocaine, whatever it is, is not a crime in Portugal. And they've instituted this very interesting system there to address the issue of drug use and destigmatize drug users and provide treatment access. And you know, there's a number of things that are different between the US and Portugal, not the least of which is Portugal has universal health care, as nearly all European nations do. But we brought him out, we brought someone down from Canada, from Toronto, who was the uh, drug policy secretary for the, for the city of Toronto. And she's, they both spoke in their own context what was going on in their local jurisdictions. And we did that to sort of demonstrate and lift up the experiences of people in other parts of the world. As from an organizing perspective, I think there's great value to engaging with uh, international uh, efforts. Insofar as we understand that the, that the federal government and the national body politic as such really could care less. Like we're so isolationist, we just don't care what the rest of the world is doing. In the, but that doesn't mean we can't use that, particularly I think in some local contexts where our local elected officials and sometimes local frameworks, they're just not as difficult to move as it is at the federal level sometimes. <coughs> and at least that's my opinion on, on, on some of these issues. And so if there's, you know, there's a lot of really interesting things happening on drug policy internationally. I mean, there's supervised injection facilities in Canada and all over Europe where people can come and consume their substances under the guise, you know, under the watchful eye of a nurse and then leave. 
bringing folks out to talk about those things, to, to even some of us who have never even contemplated something out, I think can be a powerful thing to do. And then there's a lot of interesting organizing work going on around this stuff, particularly with drug user organizations. In Canada, there's a remarkable drug user rights organization that is dealing with politics at the municipal level to change policy. And the notion of a drug user organizing body here in the States is, is sometimes something people don't even contemplate. And so there's a lot happening I think, in other parts of the world that we can learn from, and that we can build alliances with, and even have those folks to talk about their local context in a way that might help us transform our own thinking and, and really present something that might be possible, even if we know it's, we can only maybe start here in New York City, but that's, I mean, for crying out loud, if we do something here in New York City, sometimes it has a reverberating effect. So it's worth giving a shot. Well, thank you. Thank you to the panelists. Thank you to our attendees, to the guests, to the organizers. Uh, what a big announcement. Um,